To welcome our first keynote lecturer, so invited speaker, who is Alejandro Perez Caldete. So uh, he was uh, uh, the selected right since the beginning of this uh, this Royal MTC to be involved in the in such an event that we were planning to make in the first um, in the first year of the TC because uh, Alejandro has a very important uh, position as the convener of uh, WP212 restrained and imposed deformations in. FIBTG 2.1 for serviceability models. He's also a member of CNTC 250 uh, for the project team SC2 T1, uh, which is related to the revision of the Eurocodes. And this presentation has a lot to, to do with that. But of course, we mustn't forget his original affiliation. He's a professor at the Polytechnic University of Madrid and uh, the director of FICOR Engineering. So uh, these are several reasons that make him a very juicy person for to make us a very nice presentation in the beginning and uh, it's about developments in crack with calculations influence of type of force bending or tension casting position curvature and shrinkage so alejandro thank you very much for being available and uh, the floor would be yours uh, i think farid stop sharing the screen and you will be able to start your sharing thank you okay thank you very much uh, miguel for the kind introduction and thank you very much for for the invitation uh it's quite an honor for me uh to be here so, um, as so you said, I will be talking about uh, uh, developments in crack with calculations and uh, how these developments have been introduced into proposals for both the Euro code and uh, the model code revisions. Uh, and it, I will focus um, basically on the influence of the type of force, whether you have a bending uh, situation or tension situation on the effect of casting position, on the effect of curvature, and if there is time, I will talk a little bit about shrinkage. I am not sure I will, I will have, have enough time because I have only 25 minutes. So um, I will go first with an introduction and then um, go through the proposed changes to the European standards, uh, give you an overview of the proposed model, and as I said, is there is time, uh, some considerations regarding the effects of shrinkage. Um, so just to start off with, I, I would like to go a little back in time to the year 2004. So at that time, uh, I was uh, part of T then TG 4.1, uh, which was drafting uh, model code 2010. And we had a very heated discussion about whether uh, cover had an influence in crack uh, widths or not. And, and at that time, you know, Andrew Beebe published this very well-known known paper in, in Structural Concrete, and he made a very controversial statement, which was saying that uh, basically that bond had no effect or had minimal effect on crack widths, and, and the main effect was that of cover. Uh, it was not really uh, very easy to, to settle this question at the time uh, looking at uh, databases because you did not really have uh, good examples where you had the same fee over row effective ratio and a different cover. Uh, so because of this, uh, we, we started an experimental uh, campaign, which we have continued over the years. Uh, and these are two beams that were, were tested at the Technical University of Madrid in 2009 and, and as part of a, a wider campaign. But these two beams are very interesting because they have the same fee over row effective ratio, more or less. But you can see that the behavior in cracking is very different. You can see that the crack spacing is much larger when you have an, uh, this is an 82 millimeter cover and this is a 32 millimeter cover. So a larger cover, even having the same fee over row effective, uh, is increasing the crack width by a factor of almost two. Um, so this means that even though row effective uh, includes the effect of cover, uh, it is not sufficient to account for what we are observing. Um, and in terms of maximum crack uh, width, uh, as a function here of, um, I'm going to get the pointer, 
you can see it better as a function here of the of the steel stress. Um, you can see that the 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 beam with 32 millimeter covers for 250 megapascal working uh, stress uh, provided a crack width of more more or less 0.3, which would be what we would expect. But with a larger cover, this went up to uh, 0.6. So again, uh, uh, this is uh, going over by a factor of two. Um, the physical reason which, which uh, I see is that if you have a larger cover, of course, you, you don't only have the cracks which you see at the surface, you have a lot of internal cracks. And if you have a large cover, then fewer of the internal cracks make it to the surface than if you have a smaller cover. And, and this means that you have a smaller crack spacing on the surface. And this means, of course, that you have a smaller crack width on the surface. Okay, so whenever you want to change something, you need, of course, to, to lay out the reasons why you, you need to change. Um, so the reasons um, are the following. Uh, first, European models are mostly, not solely, but mostly based on the behavior of time. And they do not acknowledge a difference between cracking behavior in bending and in tension. Uh, this is one reason. The second reason is that um, the current definition of the effective area uh, incurs in significant contradictions and can be simplified. Uh, the third is that the current models do not recognize the influence of casting position and cracking behavior, even though it is well known that the, the bonds, bond uh, strength uh, is a, an important factor for the, for the cracking behavior. And, and we have experimental evidence that shows that this is actually very important. And um, if we account for this difference, we have seen that we, we can you know, achieve a significant improvement of uh, the model's uh, mm -hmm. prediction with respect to experimental data. Um, and then you can also uh, look at the effect of shrinkage because model code 2010 adds shrinkage, Euro code 2 does not. So this is something uh, which is not really uh, decided yet, but, but I think uh, that, uh, okay, hopefully I have the time to give some, some opinion on that. So the, the, if we look at the, at the mean crack spacing as a function of the diameter over the real effective ratio, uh, you can see that uh, with the current definition of both model code and euro code, uh, you can see that bending, which are in blue here, um, bending tests have a lower uh, the coefficient of determination. Um, and of course, the coefficient of determination is rather low because you don't only have the influence of the C over row effective ratio, you also have the influence of cover, which is not considered here. Um, but more interesting is that uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, measured crack width and the crack width you can estimate from the measured crack spacing and the steel stress and the tension stiffening, uh, factor, you can see that uh, these you would expect these two values to be more or less the same. They're actually uh, on the unsafe side. Um, so, so why is this? Well, I am not exactly sure, but one part of it can be because uh, you have shrinkage, unreported shrinkage strains occurring before the tests, which would, would uh, provide you this type of, of uh, behavior. But what I'm more interested in is the fact that if you look at the, the flexural tests, uh, you are much lower than if you look at the tension test. So 0 0.6 uh, slope here with an 0 0.7 slope for tension. So, so this uh, also points at an imbalance of the, of the models between, um, let's say, um, bending and tension. Uh, if we look at the calibration, model code 2010 is, is fairly well calibrated because you can see you have a, if you compare the crack spacing uh, according to the model and the measured crack spacing, you can see that you have a, a correlation line which has a slope close to one and high coefficient of determination. 
If you look at Eurocode, then you realize that the flexural uh, tests are well calibrated, but that the tension uh, model is very, very much on the safe side. And this is also well known. Um, okay, so what are the proposed changes? Uh, the first thing is that we need to address the distribution of stresses. So Eurocode 2 has a factor, K2, which uh, is equal to 0.5 when you have uh, bending, when you estimate the, the crack spacing, of course. Uh, you have a 0.5 value for bending and a one uh, uh, value of one for, for tension. And, and the explanation for this is that if you have a crack here and this is your transfer length and you want to produce a new crack at the end of the transfer length, then if you have an element in tension, then you have to uh, transmit to the concrete a force which is equal to the integral of these stresses. So all this rectangular block. But if you have an element in bending, then you can produce a crack uh, faster because the force you have to transmit to the concrete is this triangular, the integral of this, these triangular stresses, which, which it has. So, so this is the, the basis for the K2 value in your code 2. Uh, but if, if in, in, in fact, what we are uh, concerned with is not the mean stress within the tension area, but it is the mean stress within the effective area. So you have a member which is very large, the effective area can be very small with respect to the tensioned area. And, and so if you have a situation like this, uh, the, the assuming a factor K2 equals one, as, as model code uh, does, uh, can be uh, reasonable. Um, but if you have a smaller member, then what Eurocode says, is more reasonable. So uh, just by, by computing the, the mean uh, stress in the tension area, uh, in the effective tension area, you get a factor KFL, which would replace K2 in your code, and which has a very simple expression for a rectangular section, which is just the height of the section minus the effective height of the uh, tension area uh, of, of the reinforcement. Um, of a concrete around reinforcement divided by the height of the section. So this is the first point. The, the second point is um, the, the bond conditions. So when, when we, were, um, we, we were undertaking an uh, uh, experimental campaign uh, uh, to test ties, and, and when we were doing this, uh, we had one specimen uh, reinforced with 12 millimeter bars, and these bars were threaded in order to, to connect them to the, the element we used to, to apply the tension. And in, in the first test, which, which has a, a, had a 32 millimeter cover, we got a, a premature a failure. And, and so we had another specimen which had an 82 millimeter cover, which is this one. And we decided not to test it in tension, but to test it in bending. And, and we did that just for fun. And then we, we saw that uh, when comparing to this other test, which we had undertaken in 2009, these were done in 2017, uh, we had a very different cracking pattern. And, and this, this was a, a beam with the same identical area of reinforcement in tension, uh, but uh, in this case, we had a crack spacing of 25, and in this case, we had a crack spacing between 15 and 16. And, and we were puzzling about this for a long time until we realized that in the 2009 test, this was uh, a test a beam which was cast on site, and, and it was cast in poor bonding conditions. Uh, whereas the test we did in the lab, what we did was we turned around the beam so that we could have on the, on the tension uh, phase, a very nice clean surface to to adjust to our cracks. So so the difference between these two uh, was the the, uh, the positions uh, the casting position. Um, then we looked at at the results of our ties. Uh, you can see here the test setup, and um, in this case we had one face which was cast, uh, one vertical face, I mean, which was cast 
in good uh, uh, bonding position, uh, conditions, and the other one was cast in poor uh, bonding uh, conditions. And you can see here the behavior uh, is very different. Uh, the face which is in which was cast in good bonding um, conditions uh, has more cracks than the one that is cast in poor. Uh, bonding uh, conditions. And, and you can see this for the 60 millimeter bars and the 25 millimeter bars, uh, you have a very significant difference. Uh, we also looked at these uh, tests by Combric, which, where, where you could see that depending on the cover, uh, if you have a larger cover, you had a smaller effect, let's say, or more distributed effect of um, settlement. And if you had a, a smaller cover, you started getting larger effects and, and more cracking. Um, and when we looked at our results of the ties, we saw that when, when we increase the cover, the difference in crack spacing was smaller, uh, both for the 60 millimeter and the 25 millimeter bars. Um, and we also saw that when you go from 16 to 25, uh, in with a larger diameter, you have a larger effect. Also, it uh, happens here. So with, with this information, which was very poor information, uh, we, we came up with this uh, proposal, which was a, a, a bond factor, which uh, a bond position factor, which is applied to the bond term, and uh, which is 0 0.9 for elements cast in good uh, position, and this uh, expression for elements cast in poor position. And, and then this, this factor in for model code, we just simplified it to 1.2 because we did not have a lot of uh, experimental evidence to support it. And, and so we, we carried out uh, some other tests uh, to, to look at the, at the casting positions. So you can see here, uh, one of the elements was uh, cast in both positions. We already had one uh, so these are laboratory conditions. We already had one in, in on-site conditions, which we saw before. Um, and and what we did basically was to, to do the, the, we had these specimens in poor casting positions from earlier tests, and these two positions in poor casting, in uh, good casting position from previous tests. So we got all the combinations. And uh, when you look at the results, uh, this is uh, the spacing, uh, the mean spacing for elements uh, cast in poor bonding con uh, conditions and the uh, spacing of uh, elements cast in good bonding positions. And you can see that the crack spacing is always larger for elements cast in poor uh, bond conditions, uh, but also very significant is if you look at the, these two series, the green uh, dots are uh, elements which we have cast in the lab, and the uh, uh, red elements are elements that are cast on site. So you can see that the, the problem is much uh, worse with elements cast on site. And, and obviously, workmanship has also a lot to do with this problem, and it, it's going to be very difficult to quantify that, I think. Okay, the, the third uh, uh, amendment which we are proposing is to change the definition of uh, the effective area uh, for different reasons. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, currently, if you have a single bar and, and a tie reinforced with a single bar, then the whole area is effective no matter how large the, the concrete area. So you can go to infinity here. And it will still be the full concrete area would be um, um, uh, effective. I don't know how to get rid of that. Maybe okay. Anyway, um, so so and 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 another uh, problem is that if you look at um, our eyes, the, the, this is let like, let's see, we we tested these elements both in tension and in bending. So for, for the, the, the element in tension in this case, this would be the effective area. But for the element in bending, only this would be the effective area. This is because we have this H minus X over C term, which uh, does not, is not affecting uh, tensile specimens. 
and and this is just so unbalanced that it 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 can uh, really uh, not be uh, so. Um, so we we uh, and 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 the other thing we we also noticed is is if we introduce a KFL factor, which I explained to you before, accounting for the difference in uh, in um, stress distribution, then uh, you actually do not need the H minus x over 3 factor at all. So actually, this h minus x over 3 factor, in my view, is an uh, empirical factor uh, to improve the fitting of the model to the tests. Um, so so our, our proposal is just if you have an isolated bar, uh, just to have a maximum uh, height of the concrete area, which is 3.5 times uh, the mechanical cover of the bar, but not larger than five times the, the bar diameter in either direction. And if you have a group of bars, then you apply the same rules, but uh, you add the spacing between bars, right? Here, like uh, you have here. Um, so with this definition, which makes things simpler because you do not have to deal with the h minus x over three, uh, you do limit the effective area to the tension part of the section, but this uh, will uh, almost mm, not uh, be uh, a determining factor uh, in any of the cases. Uh, and so with, with the, the, this is, uh, again, uh, uh, a couple of examples. Uh, this is what you have for the tie, and this is what you have for tension according to the model code 2010. And this is another example. You can see this big difference. And what you have with the current proposal is just the same for tension and uh, flexor. OK, uh, if, if we, we plot the C overall effective ratio and multiply it by the KFL, also by the KB, against the mean crack spacing, what happens is that we do have an increase in the coefficient of determination for flexor test. So we are improving uh, somewhat uh, with respect to the, the flexor. Um, and then there's another factor which, which is in model code 2010, but only on the, on the left-hand side, which is the effect of curvature. Uh, here you have the measure crack width against the, the stress in the rebar uh, for so, so for elements which in black uh, have a 30 millimeter cover. Sorry, uh, sorry. The, the the black symbols are um, represent measurements of the crack width at the level of the reinforcement, and the white symbols represent measurement at the most tension phase. These are flexural tests. And you can see that you have an increase. You have an increase in the measure crack width at the level of the reinforcement and at the level of the most tension fiber. And this increase is larger if you have a larger cover than if you have a smaller cover. And the, and the gray dots are uh, account for the correction of the of the measurement at the level of the reinforcement by this factor. And you can see that these symbols are landing almost on top of the white symbols. So this means that this correction is actually quite effective. Okay, so, so the proposed model uh, is something like this, where if you take a, a constant value for, for this ratio, simplifies uh, to this equation. Um, and, and we are adding this K over one R factor. So basically the new elements are the KFL and the KB and the K curvature factor. Uh, and then we have shrinkage, which uh, we will see that we are uh, able to, to neglect if we have time, which I don't think we will. Uh, so just... Um, to show you an, another important thing is that this Q, which we had between flexion and tension, when we compare the measured crack width with respect to the, the estimated crack width, is corrected uh, by uh, adding this KFL factor. And, and you can see that now both uh, uh, correlation lines are almost identical. Uh, this is a 
um, calibration of the proposal. Um, so, and this is the statistical uh, value. So this is model code 2010. This is coefficient of variation, sorry. Coefficient of variation and the root mean square error. And this is Euro code two, and this is a new proposal. And what you can see is that we have uh, a significant uh, reduction of the coefficient of variation, also a significant reduction of the mean root mean square error. Uh, and then we we had a, a after calibration, we got a, a new data test from from the Interis uh, Klaklauskas, and uh, only bending test. And we also compare that with the uh, results of the model. This is the 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 graph. And these are the stats, and you can also see that again we achieve a better, uh, significantly better statistical performance with the new proposal. Okay, so if I if I go very quickly, shrinkage. Uh, if you if you look at what happens at a crack and you have shrinkage, what happens is that the, and you have an actual force. What happens is that the the stress in the steel is due to the actual force, but you also have a, a uh, contraction of concrete due to shrinkage. So this means that the uh, difference between strains and in the steel and the reinforcement is increased by the shrinkage uh, factor, by the shrinkage uh, strain. Uh, if, if we look at what happens in between cracks and we look at tension stiffening, this uh, increase is moderated by one minus kT. So this is just on the face of it. However, if you have a uh, shrinkage in the crack formation phase, uh, the fact that shrinkage develops uh, uh, makes um, increases the stresses in 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 concrete at the section between cracks, and this, in the long term, will tend to decrease the cracking force, which means that the force, if you are in in the uh, crack formation phase, the force will, will go down. Uh, and in the stabilized cracking uh, phase, uh, we will see that you can get a formation of a new crack in between uh, the cracks, which would also decrease the, uh, the crack uh, spacing. Uh, so I don't think I have time because already I have 25. Just, just to show you how the the cracking force is evolving with time. Uh, you can see that at the beginning it grows because you have increasing the strength of concrete, but due to the development of shrinkage, this starts going down. And in the end, the difference between considering and not considering shrinkage for the crack formation phase is uh, only between nine and 18%. These are just four cases which, which vary very much the height of the section and the reinforcement ratio. Uh, and so this is probably acceptable. And if we if we do the the analysis for the uh, stabilized cracking, we we'll reach the conclusion, which is right here, that the transfer length uh, becomes smaller because we are we are uh, subtracting this term. So this means that a new crack would form between uh, the the existing cracks, and this would probably offset the effect of shrinkage. So, concluding, uh, we have proposed a new coefficient to account for the effects of non-uniform stress distribution, and the introduction of this uh, coefficient allows us to delete the effect of H minus X over 3 and to ha get, have a better balance between tension and, and flexural uh, tests. Um, we have uh, uh, shown uh, experimental evidence that the casting position has strong influence of crank spacing, um, and we have tried to account this by introducing a factor KB, but this, of course, has to be refined. And the definition of the effective area has been reformulated uh, to, to eliminate inconsistencies of the current model. Um, and accounting for all these uh, changes, we have uh, proposed a recalibration of the model, and we have shown that we have a better agreement with tests. Now, regarding the effects of shrinkage in crack formation phase, the width, the crack width is underestimated by a small amount if we neglect shrinkage due to the reduction of the cracking force. And for the stabilized cracking uh, 
a phase, a new crack would form between the two most space cracks because the development of Finket leads to reduction of the transfer length. And this would of, of, offset, in most cases, increase in the crack with due to shrinkage. Okay, and thank you very much. And